right. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Cosmic Matrix podcast. Today, it's only your host is myself, Bernhard Günther, and my wife and partner, Laura, is not with me, but I have a very special guest today. And the special guest is my good colleague and friend, Tom Montag. His website is montag.net, M-O-N-T-A-L-K.net. And um, I would assume and hope that most of my viewers and audience who are familiar with my work are also familiar with Tom's work because I've quoted him a lot over the years in my writings. And Tom and I have also been part of a couple of panel discussions a few years ago uh, with other amazing researchers and colleagues. One was the Ellie Lovebite uh, panel discussion on the Ellie Love by Dark Side of Cupid topic uh, with Tom Montag, uh, Laura Leon, Eve Lorgan, James Bartley, and myself. Uh, and Tom on this uh, panel discussion that is available also on our YouTube channels. It's over a three hour discussion. And another panel discussion, Hyperdimensional Interference and Discernment, also a three hour discussion with uh, the same people. Tom, myself, James, Laura, and Eve Lorgan. Um, so I'm very, very excited about this. It's been a long time coming. I have to say, you know, I've been following Tom's work for almost 20 years now. I was just looking back. I came across your website around late 90s, early 2000. You know, it's, it's been a while, and you have definitely played a big part in my own quote-unquote awakening process, helped me to uh, get inspired about various topics, various material resources and i was just looking again on your website and and the books and resources and we are use in many ways similar resources and even i looked at the top 10 books you have on your website and even the first five of those books are also in my top 10 more or less <laughs> um especially noses or uh you know uh boris moravi's work the stellar man um and also the allies of humanity or greater spiritual community that's that's a great book as well and many, many other resources. Um, so welcome, Tom. I'm very happy to have you on here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Our first uh, podcast together. It's awesome. I know. Um, actually, your volume is really low okay, right now. That. One second. Yeah. So again, just talking about Okay, testing, here we are. Yeah. Is that better? Much better. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah, your body's work is, you have a lot of material on your website. I was just, again, looking over it, and I've read a lot of it, even not most of it, but definitely not everything. And uh, before we start and get into various topics, I just want you to introduce yourself a bit to people who are maybe not aware of you and your work. Kind of tell me about, like, how, how did you start? When did you took the so-called, quote-unquote, red pill? Or how was your path that kind of, like, inspired you to start your work and write about all this? Yeah, so my background is in physics and electrical engineering, but that only came later in life. Um, the way it all started was when I was a kid in Germany. So I'm German. I grew up in Germany, but I'm here in Florida now. Uh, so when I was a kid in Germany, uh, I had a lot of ghost encounters as a child. Um, I had some alien abduction experiences as well. Um, back then, I was always talking about the, the Steine mention or the Graue mention, which means stone men or gray men, because I, you know, I didn't know the term alien back then. Uh, so yeah, I was always telling my mom and my grandmother about these, these gray men who would come all the time. I mean, it was so frequent. It was crazy. And because I had these experiences, and I was also very naturally curious, I wanted to figure out how the world worked, you know, so into science and taking things apart and figuring, you know, how, how everything worked. But here was this big mystery of, 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 you know, ghosts and aliens and such. And so that kind of drove me into a deeper quest for understanding what these things are and reality is so strange than what's really going on. So it wasn't until I was about 12 or 13 that I got a library card and I read all the UFO books, all the metaph metaphysics books, you know, in my local library. Uh, and that kind of set me on a path of research that hasn't stopped since. So I've been going at this for about 25, 25 years now. And uh, so I went to college and I did uh, electrical engineering and physics in order to understand how UFO technology works, you know, how to apply it. Because, you know, I would read these abduction books about UFO anti-gravity engines and all these different technologies. And I wanted to know how, how, how does it work and how can you apply it, you know, for, for the benefit of humanity. So that's the reason I did physics and engineering in college. 
Mm-hmm. But during, during, during that whole time, I, I just um, came across source after source. I kept expanding my awareness. You know, I, I started out with uh, conspiracy. I got into the UFO enigma and then eventually hermeticism, Gnosticism, things like that. And uh, yeah, and then eventually I got into the Cassiopeian material and everything that came out of that, the Boris Moraviev stuff, which you're familiar with and have talked about on your site, Carlos Castaneda, everything and so on. And uh, I started my website in 1998. And, and so it's been going now for, you know, over 20 years. And um, I've communicated with thousands of people of all sorts, asking questions, sharing their experiences, their data, their research. And so it's given me this huge body of data points to try to correlate and make patterns out of. And uh, so that's where we are today, you know, me and you and others like us trying to figure out what's really going on and, and how to use it for the betterment of mankind. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. As your scientific background definitely comes through your writings, which I really enjoy. You have a good fusion of like also the intuitive metaphysical aspect or spiritual aspect of reality, but also more grounded than also in science and kind of fusing the two. Um, and that's very, very refreshing to see. And I can only imagine how many emails you're getting also from people <laughs> asking you questions and all of that and, you know, providing new material and we, we keep learning all the time. Right. So, um, well, you know, the main, what I see, you know, our work kind of intersects and, you know, we kind of complement each other almost in a, in a way, talk about very similar things. Um, the emphasis, what I see also in your work is definitely the matrix control system. And you have also a few uh, e-books out, in which people can also get at your website. One of them is called Transcending the Matrix Control System. So I want to see from your research and your experience and uh, as well, well how, how do you see the matrix? How do you define the matrix, the matrix control system? Yeah, so um, I would define the matrix as the entire system of third density and fourth density and fifth density mechanics and forces that are in place to keep us spiritually asleep. So that's why it's called the matrix because it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's a spiritual womb that we are contained within that ultimately serves in the end to um, accelerate and catalyze our spiritual evolution. But it comes with a great risk, <clears throat> which is that here within this control system, you pay with your energy and potentially your free will in order to evolve yourself. So there's, there's a cost to this game here of uh, spiritual, almost like a skydiving in a way, you know, and there's a, there's a thrill to it. There's an educational learning and growth experience to it, but it comes with it with a terrible cost of potentially losing a, a big part of your, your spiritual path as well. If you go astray and you make the wrong choices and you ally yourself with uh, the wrong values and, and forces and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, we, we are immersed in it. It spans the third dimension. It spans the fourth dimension. Um, it's within us. You know, our own shadow, our own ego is basically the gatekeeper of the matrix installed within our own being. You know, it's not actually part of us. Uh, originally, it's not part of our spirit, but it's sort of a, a graft, a control mechanism within us that we, that we should be using as avatars to exist in this world. But at the same time, this avatar has a mind of its own and it has its own value system that's rooted in materialism and all the, all the inverted spiritual values that, that define this world. And uh, it's programmed with illusion. And uh, yeah, and if you if you over identify with it, you uh, you end up falling for a lot of the traps that that underlie this existence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Like you mentioned, kind of the matrix also accelerates our spiritual gro- um, growth, and there seems to be some sort of paradox which you mentioned on your website as well. And talking about the matrix, it's a school and prison almost at the same time. The matter based on how you look at it, you know, it's it's easy to fall into. Well, you know, the victim blame trap, as I call it, you know, when we, you know, see something is done against us and just, uh, you know, against our free will. But who knows, you know, it seems to be almost there's been some sort of collective agreement to engage in this game, so to speak, or, you know, spiritual evolution. And like you said, there's a deeper teaching function and ties into the evolution of consciousness. But you also mentioned something has been just corrupted and it kind of ties into the corruption of the demiurge. Um, uh, which I know you have uh, written an article about. Can you expand a little bit on that, the demiurge and what it is? Yeah, so the ancients believed that the universe had a soul and that the soul was called the demiurge. And what the role of the demiurge is, it's basically to fashion and to perpetuate and to sustain this illusion that we call reality. 
Okay, so it's kind of like the, uh, the HTML code. It's like the matrix code of the matrix itself. It's uh, the matrix mainframe. And, uh, and without the Demiurge, basically, things wouldn't remain as solid as they are right now. So if you think about the dreams that you have at night, okay, your, your dreams, they are being projected by your own subconscious, and it's only one subconscious. And because of that, when you're in the dream, uh, you notice how fluid and malleable the, the dream environment is. Well, if you were to have millions and trillions of beings all putting their consciousness together, their subconscious together, to create this, uh, you know, almost like a universal subconscious, then it would create a dream that's so solid and so real that it would be indistinguishable from reality. And that's most likely what reality actually is. You know, um, everything is ultimately thought and consciousness and vibration. Uh, it's only just a question of what agreements there are made between different consciousnesses to create common rules by which consciousnesses play by. Okay, it's just like with chess, you know, both players agree to a common set of rules, the game board, the pieces, and that's what makes chess possible. So reality is kind of like a bigger version of that, where, uh, you know, you have, we have different uh, rule sets, restrictions, metaphysical laws, physical laws, and that creates this game environment that, that we're within. And the Demiurge is, you know, it's sort of like the, the gamekeeper, the projector of the game board and the game pieces, and, and it's kind of what binds us all together. Um, so now, funny enough, you know, Plato and um, a lot of the other Greeks, they believe that the, Demi that the Demiurge was positive. They believe that it was an emanation of the divine, you know, something that the divine logos charged with uh, creating and sustaining this reality. So they saw nothing wrong with it. However, the Gnostics, centuries later, they believe that the, that the Demiurge was basically evil, that it was a false god who created this false illusion that we're within in order to hide the true spiritual reality that lies beyond this reality. So that's the, that's the Gnostic idea. And the question is, how do you reconcile these two viewpoints? You know, you got a good Demiurge on the one hand and then this evil Demiurge on the other. And from everything that I researched, what I came to conclude is that it's kind of like having a, a computer operating system that's partly infected with malware. So there's a segment of the operating system now which is corrupted, in other words. And uh, this, this corrupted portion has its own agenda, you know, to, to steal data or in our case, to steal energy. Um, but it's only a portion within a larger uh, demiurge framework, which is ultimately positive in the sense that it serves evolution and it serves creation. But because of the way it works, which is that um, our own consciousness feeds into it and it feeds it back to us in terms of our experiences. Okay. Well, if either our own pain and suffering and illusory values get fed into it, then we're going to get that reflected back to us in terms of the kind of reality we exist in. But also at the same time, there are also negative beings who, through technology and occult methods, have figured out how to manipulate the Demiurge in order to serve their own ends. And that includes, you know, creating um, compartmentalized realities. In other words, split off timelines. You know, it's a, their own, it's, it's, like a, it's like a nightmare version of a dream. It's like the little corner of a dream that's like a nightmare. And these beings, they have figured out how to manipulate the Demiurge using what I call Demiurgic technology, which is just physics that combines um, normal physics with etheric and astral energy manipulation. So it's like psionic technology, basically. And they can use that to manipulate uh, this dream at the quantum level and uh, to manipulate the Demiurge, which is sort of like the, the energetic subconscious understructure of reality, in order to keep this reality um, into being more predatory than it probably should be. So even though I think originally and ideally this, this, this matrix that we're in is a, a learning medium, uh, I think a part of it has been corrupted and has been turned over into an unfair kind of a predation energy farm prison network. So that, that thing coexists along with the actual still remaining positive part of the Demiurge matrix system. And because they both exist side by side, almost like a, like a Vesica Pisces, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're here in the middle. And it's actually, uh, it's actually our choices, our learning path, our free will, and what we resonate and vibrate with, both consciously and subconsciously, that determines which of those we resonate more with and therefore get feedback loops from. You know? So in some ways, we are in charge of tuning that radio dial between the more positive and the more negative aspects of this matrix or of the Demiurge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's sort of the basics about the Demiurge. Yeah. So that also, so basically also then in terms of how this ties into the hyperdimensional matrix, negative aliens, entities, these are called forces, you know, in the astral realm also based also thought projections that have been just created over time in the sense. Mm -hmm. 
right? And yeah. we create them. So that in that sense, it's really important to understand. I feel that the matrix truly works through us, and we just feed it through mm -hmm. our own whatever manipulated emotional responses, thought projections. Yeah, yeah, right. Because if you think about it, um, like I said, in our nightly dreams, this reality seems to be just like a more collective, uh, more solid, stable version of it. You know, there's that quote that's been attributed to Einstein, but no one knows if he actually said it, which is that you know, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. Okay. Who knows if you said it, but it's true. Yeah. And that, you know, that the rules here are more solid. Now, in our, in our dreams, when you become lucid, you realize you can change the dream. And you'll also notice that what you, what you feed out emotionally, your expectations, your anticipations in a dream, end up manipulating the dream and changing it to reflect that back at you, okay? So a similar process happens in our waking world. It's just a lot slower than it is in our nightly dreams. And, it, and it's, a, it's a collective process, so... You know, this whole idea that uh, in the new age that you create your own reality. I think that's, I think that's only partly true because it's not 100% creation. It's not 100% because this is a collective reality. It's shared. So when you share a reality with someone else, uh, if you try to change that reality, but they don't want it changed, then you're going to encounter resistance. Okay. And so here we are with the demiurge, which is sort of the, the, the key rule maker of this reality and all the other people that are participating and plugging into it. And if they want this world to go in a certain way, it's going to go that way. And you only have one vote in how that happens. However, you can control your corner of reality because no one else is experiencing that corner because it's yours, right? So there are aspects of your life and your reality that you can control using your thoughts, your feelings, your subconscious beliefs. Um, but you mentioned the idea of thought forms, thought projections, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then that, that's a key point because, you know, what is the demiurge really? And, you know, the ancients, like I said, they believed that it was the soul of the universe. But then that brings up the question, well, what is a soul? And the soul, uh, well, there's different ways to define it. But the way I define it is that you've got the spirit at the very top, which I define as the individualized core of consciousness, you know, your God spark, your, your individual permanent core that can reincarnate and so on. And then you've got your physical body, which is just the, uh, the dream character, you know, the, the avatar that you're playing. But in order to link those two together, you have to have these intermediate layers, and that's where the so-called etheric and astral bodies come in. And the etheric body is, uh, if you know anything about web programming, there's this uh, whole thing about meta metadata. It's all the stuff that you don't see when you visit a website. It's all those scripts behind it, all the code that surrounds everything that you see that makes it, makes it possible, kind of like the, the scaffolding of, of a, of a web page. And the etheric plane is like the energetic scaffold of the physical the physical world is a, so the physical world is a, is a projection of the etheric and the astral on the other hand that's like an inner world uh, they call it the inner planes and that's where energies of emotions passions uh to some degree spiritual life force energy things like that and also certain beings exist there so your etheric body and your astral body those two are the two interlinking uh transducers between the spirit and the physical body okay those two things together, the etheric and the astral, that is what constitutes the soul, at least as I, as I define it. So the soul of the universe, if you really think about it, it's actually the sum total of the etheric and astral environment that we are all immersed in. Okay. Mm. Now, you mentioned thought forms and thought projections. So what that means is, for those who don't know, a thought form, you know, it's also called an egregore, it's also called a, uh, a tulpa, you know, by the, uh, by the Eastern, by the Eastern people. And, uh, what that is, is when you put a lot of energy, a lot of focus, a lot of emotional uh, content into a thought, it actually impresses itself into your, into your surrounding etheric and astral environment and becomes its own thing. Like, for example, if right now I got really angry and I, and I had a burst of anger in me, uh, a clairvoyant would be able to look at me and actually see probably a dark energy form come out of me and kind of like float away towards the object of my anger or hatred. Okay. Now, if you think about how much anger and suffering and hatred humanity has undergone over the past, you know, 10, 20,000 years and how long those thought forms can stick around, they can uh, accumulate, you know, it's almost like pollution in a way, you know, the same way we have air pollution and garbage pollution now. Uh, there's been thought form pollution for a very, very long time. And what that is, that is our own corruption of the demiurge, our own corruption of the etheric and astral environment that we're immersed within. And unfortunately, when these things collect, especially in a certain area, like a certain town or so, uh, it, can, it can bias the probability of events in that town towards increased accidents, illness, crime, you know, suffering, things like that. So I think, um, 
I think that our 3D reality that we're within this world, this earth, it's vibrationally under the control of a lot of these thought forms that have been accumulated for a very, very long time. And in addition to that, there are actual uh, negative parasitic entities that, you know, kind of use that as a, as a mechanism for, uh, you know, increasing the suffering here and also feeding upon the people here, like feeding upon their energies, their suffering and, and so on. You know, there's this book by Dr. William Baldwin called CEVI, which means Close mm-hmm. Encounters of the Sixth Kind, right? Yeah. And, and that book is entirely about uh, the etheric energy farm and th- these things that he calls dark force entities, which, you know, it's another name for fourth density STS and so on, dem- demons and such. Uh, he talked about people being able to see uh, astral and etheric feeding tubes connecting people to these, these collection vats on other, other realms that collect our energy and then gets refined there and gets shipped off to who knows where as part of this, you know, inter interdimensional intergalactic uh, energy economy that we are part of unwittingly, you know, and there's only a few people, you know, the Gnostics, you know, people like you and me and, and other researchers and such who are aware of the energy form component of this matrix. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a fact of life. Yeah. So that basically brings it down to the, the main, you know, quote unquote, agenda of these matrix forces is to create this this loose frequency. Also, what Robert Monroe I think talked about. Mm-hmm. Then and the so called you know what Carlos Castaneda, Don Juan talked the topic of all topics, right? That humanity is not on top of the food chain, and that we are just food for these higher negative forces, and they you know feed off of the suffering and the lower lower nature of humanity and. This, this, you know, um, ego, egoic consciousness, separative consciousness, and just a lot of negative emotions that can project it. And it, I think it's like what you mentioned: can understand how to these forces work through us, and we almost then, you know, based on the concept of reality creation, also create a reality that is in alignment with their agenda, right? So to speak, because when you look at the world, you know, we look at the cities. You know, in our first world, we are so removed from nature and spirit. It's almost like an alien civilization. You know, I think once you start to, as Moravia said in Gnosis, start to see the unseen, your perception is cleansed, right? Seeing through appearances, you can see this this hyperdimensional overlay how it works through our civilizations, through human humans, through ourselves, and keeps sustaining itself and feeding itself, so to speak. Um, now, on that, how do you see now, especially nowadays, because, I mean, <clears throat> it's always, the times are always intense in some way or another, you know, um, and the energies are increasing, but there seems to be some sort of acceleration. I feel the matrix is on, on overdrive, but it seems on some level more and more people are quote-unquote awakening, right? On some levels, as both the dark and light is increasing, so how, do you, how do you see the matrix, especially the hyperdimensional matrix, these unseen forces, um, affecting the world in this day and age, maybe in current events, how is it manifesting in physical reality? Yeah, I think um, the overall, the big picture viewpoint of it would be that, so what it ties into is what we talked about how the world is both a, a school or a, or a gym or, you know, a learning grounds and also a prison and a farm, you know, it's both at the same time. And related to that, it seems to be that we are approaching a critical point. Okay. We're, that this game that we're in, this, this phase of the game, I should say, is drawing to a close, okay? And what that manifests as primarily is what I call a polarization phenomenon. That's where the dark is getting darker and the light is mm-hmm. getting lighter. So it's a separation. And how that separation happens is through catalysts that force a choice, you know? It used to be that, um, you know, when the, when the world was a little more uh, calm and stable, people have the luxury of sitting on the fence of being in that gray zone and not really standing for, for much, you know, so that's why more people could get along because, uh, you know, back then views weren't really projected as loudly as they, as they are now. Um, but you know, we are being, we, you know, both in our individual lives and also collectively, we're being exposed to catalysts that force us to choose what we really stand for, you know, so it starts revealing people for who they actually are as time goes on. And, uh, kind of reminds me of, uh, I think it's both in the Bible and also in the gospel of Thomas, you know, the idea that during the so-called end days, the, the, the weeds and the, and the wheat will both be tall and it'll be easy to see which one is which, you know, and that's part of the, the whole idea of apocalypse, you know, or revelation, just the idea that awareness is increasing and things are being exposed for what they actually are. 
But this polarization phenomenon, it's both an increase in the type of learning lessons that we are getting, you know, the, the rate of it, the, the intensity of it. And it's also an increase by the dark component of the matrix, which is that the matrix is now undergoing a, uh, it's, it's lunging for a power grab. You know, it's trying to secure its control because a lot of the control that it's had up to this point has been based on the luxury of people being ignorant and giving it that power. But now that awareness is increasing, they have to step up their game and, you know, rely on big things like big tech, uh, big tech censorship, uh, media propaganda, you know, things like false flags and disarmament, you know, all, all the typical tyranny type uh, tricks and tactics that have been implemented throughout history. You know, that happens again and again, but now they're, you know, putting, cranking it all up at the same time. And um, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it reminds me of what Steiner talked about, the three forces of evil. He talked about the force of Ahriman, uh, Lucifer, and Sorat. And what these manifest as nowadays is basically the idea of AI, artificial intelligence, uh, transhumanism, and the hive mind behavior that we see in social media, you know, and, and amongst, uh, you know, certain leftist progressive groups. So this this kind of a uh, artificial intelligent, you know, technological divorce from nature kind of hive mind thing, and it's 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 ultimately it's it's kind of demonic, you know. And th historically, it's manifested, you know, previously, and it's still manifesting as things like Marxism, socialism, communism, fascism, uh, feudalism, and authoritarianism. And that has always been sort of the uh, the danger nipping at our heels. Uh, it's always the thing that's been threatening to take this matrix and turn it into a, a literal permanent nightmare, you know, like even worse than, than what it is right now. Uh, so a lot of that stuff, it's unfortunately, it's a sort of an unholy alliance between the evil and uh, the naive or the, or the stupid. You know, it, it always takes mm -hmm. two to tango. And so when you look at these groups, you know, whether it's, whether it's fascism or communism or Marxism, whatever, it's always the a huge body of the naive, you know, the sheep and the wolves that prey upon them. And that's like a self-sustaining predator-prey cycle. And that's all part of the STS predator-prey dynamic. You know, you can't have a predator without prey or, or vice versa. And uh, that's sort of the, the, the vortex that a lot of people throughout history and nowadays have been getting sucked into and which seems to be getting worse with, with time, okay? But at the same time, that's serving as a catalyst for a kind of a, a populist counter-movement. And when I say populism, you know, that, that can have negative connotations too. Like, you know, Nazism was also uh, founded on populism, you know, there's a mass hysteria kind of propping it up. But when I'm talking about populism, I'm just talking about the, the people kind of taking back their power from authoritarians. And that's what I mean by populism. So if we're just talking strictly politically, I mean, if you look back, probably, uh, probably started with Ron Paul and his presidential campaign. And, uh, you know, and also Alex Jones, of all people, David Icke, throughout the 90s and the early 2000s. You know, for all their faults, they played a big role in making fringe material go mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so that's why nowadays, you know, even, even, even the, the people who don't believe in that stuff on the internet, you know, they make jokes about the Illuminati and the reptilian shapeshifters and, you know, chemtrails. They know these terms. They're familiar with these terms, even if they don't believe them. And we have, you know, a lot of these, uh, these, these conspiracy icebreakers like Jones and Ike and such to, to credit with that. But ultimately, that whole thing led to the eventual election of Trump and the whole populist movement, you know, and the Fed and libertarianism and, and uh, you know, fighting against uh, the, the over, oversteps of political correctness. So that's kind of where we find ourselves nowadays. Uh, I'm not saying that the populist movement with Trump and MAGA and all that is, is a spiritual thing. It's, it's, it's strictly confined within the third density paradigm, you know. Um, so, you know, it, it falls for certain illusions and false opposites. But it's... Uh, it's a way of breaking down the status quo of what has been. And only by breaking that status quo down uh, do we even have an opportunity for making something better, even if it carries the risk of turning into something else, okay? So, like, for example, with Trump, you know, done a lot of good things. But if you look at what he's for, he's for 5G. He's for uh, police state surveillance. He's for expanding the military, uh, you know, expanding the police state. And those can be used for good, but it always carries the risk that this whole entire thing, you know, taking down the cabal and, you know, taking down these, these corrupt people could lead to an eventual, almost like a Fourth Reich technocratic scenario where you have, you know, an age of peace and progress, you know, black ops technologies are given to the world for, you know, free energy purposes and, you know, awesome, right? But funny enough, if that were to happen, 
it would fulfill, you know, point by point, pretty much everything that the Christians have been prophesying about the Antichrist. Mm. So it's funny that, uh, you know, people on the left are calling Trump the Antichrist in a, in a derogatory way, like, oh, he's so bad, he's Antichrist. When in truth, he's actually doing a lot of good, but that good can lead to a kind of sophisticated evil, which would, in fact, fit the qualities of an Antichrist. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just putting it out there for people who are into that prophetic stuff, you know, <clears throat> something to think about. But um, if we're talking about what the end game is, you know, of this whole agenda, it's polarization, but polarization towards what? Well, the positive end game would be to allow the catalysts of suffering, shock, and revelation to wake people up. You know, a lot of what's happening now is to wake people out of, out of their illusion, um, to destroy the illusion so that people have uh, a chance to choose true reality. Because as long as they're comfortably asleep within the dream, they're never going to wake up from it. You know, they're, and any one of us who has, who has awakened from our previous levels of illusion, we've done so due to various... Uh, shocks and catalysts and realizations that, you know, shook us out of it. Okay. And that has to happen on a mass level. Um, and that can only happen if these catalysts stir up, uh, the necessary discernment, wisdom, uh, courage, and heart that is needed in order to, you know, bring us to the next level. Now in conjunction with that, there's also the negative end game, which is to trap people deeper within this layer of illusion. Uh, and that would be happening through things like transhumanism, genetic modification, uh, virtual reality, surveillance, basically to lock the planet down for, uh, well, we can get into that in a bit, but to lock it down for an eventual takeover by negative alien forces, overtly. Mm. I mean, they're already manipulating things, but I'm talking about like literally out in the open being hailed as you know our saviors, things like that. So the negative end game is to what I call complete the fall of man, to complete the fall of man. Because we've already fallen from a higher level into this 3D STS, you know, matrix, you know, prison kind of thing, right? But we haven't fully fallen because we still have the capacity to resist. We still have the capacity to awaken. But if we are genetically modified again, you know, assimilated by alien hybrid type breeding programs and, you know, transhumanistic uh, surveillance and technology implants and things like that, then um, it's going to be way harder to awaken from that. Okay, so that's the risk that this whole grand game carries that, you know, we're here to catalyze our spiritual evolution, but we can also slip and fall. So it's kind of like a game of uh, shoots and ladders, you know, in the sense of like, you know, you can climb, but you can fall down just as easily depending on, on what the choices we are that, you know, that, that we make. Yeah, no, no, very true. Excellent. So it seems also with regards to the end game of the negative agenda, you're just describing, and you mentioned before that transhumanism and AI is playing a huge role, like the merging of man and machine to almost like extract the soul, right? In order to prepare our vessels for, in a sense, incarnational opportunities for these forces to fully occupy, occupy ourselves, right? And fully take over by removing ourselves more and more from essence, from our soul potential and whatnot, right? And make us more and more mechanical. Um, it's also, yeah, interesting what you mentioned with the polarization and Trump and that's, uh, you know, the political craziness out there. And it's fascinating to see because I'm not, you know, so I'm not a Trump, you know, Haley a savior type either, right? But I'm also not feeding if, uh, into the projections of the left into this guy because he's actually a, a catalyst, a force, right? That can help to awaken a lot of people. Uh, it's really interesting. And it's fascinating to see how, you know, with this whole polarization, which also ties into the feel the matrix agenda or modus operandi of divide and conquer, right? The whole left versus right, especially the left in this day and age, you know, seems to be more and more actually supporting the matrix agenda of the hive mind, homogenization of humanity, socialism, more government, more control, more censorship, in all of that, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, you know, <clears throat> in the past, almost the right was always considered the evil force, so to speak. And now the left is, is you know, from, from the matrix perspective, more and more in alignment with the, the matrix agenda. But, you know, we see this obviously, especially in, in, in the U.S., the, the left and right polarization and, and conflict and projection on, onto each other. And like you said, there's always opportunity for healing for, to wake up right in any conflict and you said as you said uh, rightly as well we need friction we need shocks and catalysts we see it in our own lives to you know ignite the fire to fuse the magnetic center so to speak internally right but as long as you're projecting externally and act on these projections emotional illusion whatnot we just feed the matrix and go along with the agenda 
Um, so how do you see, because what I've hypothesized and I believe you have written about this in, your, in, in, in one of your articles as well, so-called timeline reality split, like the splitting of humanity, various other esoteric teachings talk about it. You know, the New Age has kind of distorted it with like ascension to 5D or something, right? But there seems to be a splitting happening, right, of sun part of humanity, quote unquote, moving up and another part not only staying, but even disintegrating because they cannot hold the frequencies. Because like, as we say in this time of transition, as Mariah, we've called it, we're in right now, it's also like this, the divine force is also trying to anchor itself and bring in everything up and anything that can sustain the pressure and not deal with the integration process needs to almost disintegrate. So how, how do you see this, what I call the timeline reality split or in, in that's kind of happening right now and where it may be leading to. Yeah. So reality is almost like a, like a discussion forum in that everyone's there and you know, everyone's interacting and learning and, and so on. But as often happens in forums, well, if they're not moderated too well, uh, they, they can develop into cliques, different factions. And usually what happens over time is when the divide gets big enough, the forum splits off, you know, some group of people, either good ones or the, the more negative ones, they, they leave and they form their own forum. And uh, I think that sort of that's, that seems to be happening with reality as well. So when I talked about how the matrix kind of feeds back to us the reality that we project um, internally through our thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, and you know, choice of learning lessons, that's also happening on a collective level. And as long as one timeline, one reality can sustain the, the learning needs of everyone, then great, you know, it, it's, it's one timeline. But if the, if the population polarizes enough that one reality cannot sustain both, then it would have to split. So I'll give just one theoretical example. Let's say that um, one half of the timeline resonates strongly with just the idea of drama and suffering. And the other half of the population, or maybe it's not even half, maybe it's only the other 10%, uh, resonates with freedom and, and happiness and courage and you know creativity, things like that. If that divide gets strong enough, it wouldn't be impossible for, let's say, a catalyst of, uh, I don't know, some sort of a global disaster, you know, a comet impact or solar EMP event or something to happen, where if that were to happen, you can't have an entire planet uh, accommodate both, both those things. You can't, have the comet, you can't have the planet be hit by a comet and have all the creative, positive people experience you know, a positive life after that because things, conditions are just so bad. So at that point, that would be an actual, almost like a quantum splitting catalyst where because you have these different parts of the population wanting different things, the timeline would have to split between the positive part of the population, you know, either going to a different realm or a different timeline and the other ones staying behind to experience this cataclysm. And uh, funny enough, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a you know, fundamentalist Christian or anything, but, you know, they talk about this whole idea of the rapture and you know, the whole tribulation period, like how... Certain people are lifted up into heaven and then, and then the other ones stay behind to go through, oh, I think like seven years of tribulation or something. So, you know, religion often distorts what the truth is, but it also reflects it too. So I think uh, that that might be indicative of how a timeline split would happen. That, uh, you know, because even, even right now, if you are friends with someone, but you, you know, you become too different in your vibes, uh, you, you start parting ways and you just do that by maybe not seeing each other as often and, or maybe not hearing from them anymore. And then you don't know, you, you don't know where they are, but they're somewhere. Okay. And what that is, is then that's a very gentle beginning level uh, timeline split between you and them. Because for all you know, they could have disappeared into thin air, thin air. You wouldn't know because you haven't heard from them in years. Okay. So if the population were to split, I think there may be ways for the, uh, the, the simulation, you know, this matrix simulation to make a continuous storyline to ensure that we are not in the vicinity of these other people that we no longer resonate with, you know, and what that would then would come together with is this whole idea of separation and gathering, you know, more good people coming together and more of yourself isolating yourself from the people you're no longer compatible with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how that would work out, but if there's enough of a catalyst uh, and enough of the story script writing to segue people out of each other's lives, then it would be possible eventually to have uh, some sort of a, a splitting of the timeline where you would never see them again and they could be in a completely different reality, but it wouldn't necessarily shock you because it's not like you saw them disappear in front of your eyes. 
you know, they, they hadn't been in your life for a while and now they, they could be on a completely different timeline and, and you wouldn't know. You know, mm. that, that's strictly speaking timeline stuff. But if you want to talk about things like the fourth density shift, things mm. like that, you know, shifting into fourth density, you know, what the raw material call, calls the harvest, you know, harvest for has both positive and negative connotations, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's okay. It's, it's harvest in the sense that, okay, it's graduation. All, all the, all the, all the good wheat gets to go on the truck, haul right. off to where, who knows. Right. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you want to talk about the harvest and fourth density shift and things like that, um, the reason it hasn't happened so far is because the status quo and the illusion is too strong and it's still humming along very nicely. Mm-hmm. But once things here start to fall apart, once the status quo starts to crumble, you know, whether due to economic collapse or people waking up beyond a certain point, uh, at that point, then, you know, everything's open to something like that happening. And it could either be that, um, you know, a mass die off occurs, maybe only 10% survive. And of those 10%, you know, over the span of centuries, Earth becomes a more and more fourth density. You know, people start getting psychic powers and developing uh, psionic technologies. Or it could be that at the very beginning, uh, some sort of a wave of hyperdimensional energy hits and uh, the people who are resonating with it and receptive to it are basically boosted up, you know, at, at the etheric psychic chakra level and are able to pop into a higher dimension or another positive timeline, which would be, you know, the fourth density STO timeline. And uh, that would be more of a rapture scenario. You know, so I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, I think I think we'll know it when we see it, and it would only happen after a sequence of steps occur. You know, at the world level, where uh, the status quo as we know it kind of falls apart because it has to fall apart in order for something yeah. new to be born. Yeah, I would also imagine. I mean, in this current state of being a conscious man right now, it's it's impossible for the mind to imagine for the existence or the shift into that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting what you said with the timeline split. It's, it seems like the way you described it makes so much sense because it's almost like a necessity, right? With the increasing energies and also to ensure just from basic free will perspective for the evolution of consciousness to make sure that everybody still, you know, needs to learn the lesson they need to learn and you don't get to skip, skip lessons, so to speak, right? I mean, it reminds me of, I recently got deeper into the teachings of integral yoga by Sri Aurobindo and the mother and was watching... Um, this video series by this guy Shradalu who talks about their work. I post actually some of the uh, talks on 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 the forum. Um, and he, I didn't even know that uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother <clears throat> also talked about the splitting of humanity. You know, and there's even what they say is either truth or abyss, right? And the supramental conscious coming down. And it is, it is. I feel uh, the the choice in this day and age is perv- you cannot stay on the side. Like you mentioned before, it's it's harder to stay on the sidelines anymore, right? You know, it's almost mm-hmm. like you cannot hide behind ignorance anymore, right? And your stuff is just coming up, and the more people are just not don't have the foundation of what I feel, especially not engaged, you know, in more deeper inner work, which these you know this pressure forces you to do to be more introspective, work on your stuff, uh, then you know kind of disintegrate or fall apart and a lot of people going through a lot of hardship in this day and age you know especially internally emotionally interpersonally but i've meant what you mentioned I've, I've definitely seen this in my life as well with people fading out of my life literally you know it's like it's, it's very much a different timeline and it's it seems like a natural process right um and, you know, it also like in sense, the reality reflects where you are at on some level. And then on the positive sense, you gravitate more towards people who are quote unquote like-minded or similar, you know, more collinear. I think that's what we are moving mm. towards into as well. Right. And I feel it's very important because on this path, what I've noticed, I'm sure you can maybe relate to, to that uh, as well. The path can be sometimes very lonely, you know, especially when you start waking up and you cannot relate to anything, anybody anymore. And you know, and all this craziness in the world, your own stuff coming up and just integrating it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's easy, you know, it's, it's important lesson also to learn solitude, right? To be with yourself, but you can easily fall into isolation, right? So it is kind of also part important to quote unquote, build cum- community without the hive mind thinking, but with, you know, without any dogma around it or authority or hi- hierarchy or anything where the individual is respected, but we, it, seems more and more that we need each other to support each other right and you know that kind of feel happens naturally the more we are sincere within our work and you know seek truth in all of that 
Um, but that brings it to, I also wanted to get your input into the so-called truth movement out there, right? Which, like you said, has more and more gained popularity. And you're right, we should give people like David Icke, which also I remember him getting into the 90s, helped me in my quote-unquote awakening process. And, you know, he has his faults, whatnot, and you may agree or disagree with many things. Alex Jones as well in a way, although <laughs> in terms of personality development, that's a different story. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in this day, and definitely, I mean, I'm sure you can see it in your work too and how many people <clears throat> visit your site that there are more and more people are interested in these topics, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely that increase. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yes, there's this, this awakening happening. And, you know, in my work, I've been also the more, especially over the past few years, getting more popular with my work and got invited to speak at various events and conferences. You know, um, one of them was the Anacapulco conference last year. It was a huge, big anarchist conference, you know, um, you know, uh, based on voluntarianism and all of that. Uh, and it was very interesting. I was speaking to also Mark Passio. I don't know his work. He has some good uh, things to say. But what I noticed in general, the so-called truth movement and so-called armchair activists on the internet, social media, just, you know, pointing out to corruption. It's fine to spread awareness to make people aware, right, of what's happening in the 3D matrix. But I just see this, you know, this locked in a tunnel vision of the 3D matrix, right? And mm -hmm. kind of just getting distracted by the shadows on the wall, like in Plato's allegory of the cave mm -hmm. and mistaking symptoms for causes and almost uh, feeding the, um, the divide and conquer frequency of, of the matrix agenda, right? And, you know, not understanding, Many people, also, even when I was at this this conference, which was huge, was I was I think speaking in front of fifteen hundred people, which was you know incredible and 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 all of that. But what I noticed, a lot of people in the so called truth movement have are atheists, very materialist, maybe a way of um, you know, especially in the anarchist movement, maybe aware of the government corruption, but no understanding of deeper esoteric spiritual laws, universal laws, or seeing it, this whole scenario in right now as from the what we talked about before at the beginning from the bigger picture of the evolution of consciousness and that everything, all these are lessons, you know, and the mm -hmm. matrix has a teaching function. There's almost too much like pro shadow projection and trying to get rid of evil in rather than transmuting it and transcending it. Yeah. So what is, what is, what do you see in the popular so-called truth movement in this day and age and the blind spots? Yeah. Well, I mean, we both know that awakening comes in stages. So you know, it's okay if someone's at the level of, you know, being only thinking about 3D conspiracy, but the problem is getting stuck there, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to be stuck there forever. It should only be a stepping stone to a greater awakening. And so, you know, I thought about like, you know, why do, why do people get stuck? And uh, I think partly it's, could be ego identity. You know, maybe they found something that's good enough for them that, that, that feeds into some sort of ego insecurity that they have, you know, uh, it could be because they, they entered into a big maze that they got lost in, you know, it's like, uh, it's like people who they adopt a certain religion, you know, which has, you know, huge texts, you know, huge scriptures to go through. And it's so huge that they spend their entire lives trying to decipher it, you know, trying to find the truth that's there. And so that occupies them, you know, so they're, they're kind of like lost in this maze that they just haven't gotten beyond because they're still in it trying to figure their way around. Uh, and it's also a lot of times because they lack the experience, the personal experience and therefore context for a lot of these, these higher perspectives, you know, or maybe they're just not very observant. So they haven't noticed things like synchronicity and deja vu and matrix glitches and, you know, people who seem to be possessed, things like that, things that, that would indicate that there's a higher level to this entire thing beyond just, you know, human Illuminati people pulling strings, you know, it goes way beyond that. Uh, and it's just like Plato's cave, like you said, you know, they're, they're basically holding a torch to the shadows getting rid of the shadows, but it's not getting rid of the source of the shadow. So they take mm. the torch away and the shadows are back. So that's what a lot of this uh, truth or stuff is because they're not looking for the, uh, the true sources and therefore the real solutions to a lot of what's going on. Uh, I noticed a lot of times they tend to be kind of one dimensional, uh, not very self-aware. So therefore they never look within themselves. Um, yeah. And, and because they don't do that, they therefore they're, they're easy. They're easy prey for forces that do things like thought manipulation, you know, telepathically inserting, thoughts and feelings and nudges. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're just uh, pawns on a chessboard for the most part. They think they're accomplishing good, but like you said, they're, they're feeding into the matrix game of divide and conquer. It's because yeah. they're, they're perpetuating an illusion. And it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a common trick 
that 40 service to self forces do, which is to cover up a greater conspiracy by uh, promoting a lesser conspiracy. So, you know, there's people who spend their entire lives getting focused on the JFK assassination or 9-11 or, you know, the moon landing or, you know, Bigfoot or whatever. But it goes way beyond that, of course. And if you, and if you don't look there, you're going you're gonna to miss the big pieces. So, you know, what are some of these sources that these people are ignoring? Well, things like uh, spiritless humans, you know, organic mm. portals, NPCs, sociopaths, psychopaths. That's just such a huge component of what's going on here because those are the, uh, the background characters that make, that make this negative part of the matrix work. You know, it's the gears of the matrix. They, they, they're the ones who, they're, they're the, uh, I don't know, they're just uh, the hired clappers of the matrix, you know, that keep this illusion going. You've got that, you've got demonic forces that are shadowing and possessing and hosting people, influencing them. That's uh, such a common thing. You've got things like military and alien abductions, for example which, you know, it's not happening to everyone, but it's happening to enough that you have to question the motives of, you know, things like school shooters and, or even people out there uh, on on the lecture circuit pitching for the gray aliens and talking about how awesome they are and how we should, you know, welcome them Mm -hmm. with open arms. Where are they getting that idea from? You know, is everything that they were shown the truth or were they being uh, given staged scenarios in order to turn them into mouthpieces for alien disinformation? Uh, another thing these truthers are ignoring is things like what we talked about reality creation, you know, the, the quantum aspect of how thoughts interact with our reality, that feedback loop, which is such a huge component of it too. Uh, you know, things like hidden technology, uh, the etheric and the astral realms, uh, timeline manipulation, matrix glitches, artificial synchronicities, um, or about how our own genetics seem to be handicapped due to ancient genetic engineering by, you know, various alien forces. Uh, and how that genetic engineering has also stunted our ability to not only perceive higher reality, um, but also to be ourselves, to be our true selves, because we have installed within us the predator, as Carlos Castaneda wrote, mm-hmm. you know, which is our ego and our shadow and, you know, I guess uh, Freud would call the id. Um, so we have that within us. And that whole entire thing is being ignored by these people who are, who are obsessed with, you know, 3D conspiracies. And it's because they have within themselves, they have the capacity for, for reason, for rationality and truth and justice. But it's, it's kind of like, like Don Quixote tilting at windmills and that mm. they're, they're being obsessed with, with fighting things that are only the symptoms and not the actual true cause of the problems that are here. Yeah. And for that reason, they ignore the real solutions that we have access to, which is the whole reason why they even exist and why they've been manipulated into propagating you know, this 3D conspiracy research. Um, things like our intuition, our precognition, which are really powerful abilities if you think about it, because those things supersede logic and rationality. So a lot of people are stuck at the level. Well, okay. So a lot of people out there, if you look at the, you know, the middle of the bell curve, they're, they're emotional thinkers. You know, they don't think very logically or rationally. They just think, they think just enough to decide whom to let to think for them. Okay. Um, and then there's others who look at them and say, ah, you know, you're, you're so, you're so hysterical. You know, you don't think too clearly. I mean, look at me and my clear thinking, here's my awesome arguments and I'm demolishing your, you know, baseless views. And so there's these people who pride themselves on their intellect on uh, thinking with a hammer. Right. All right. And uh, the problem is you can think with a hammer all you want, but what is holding the hammer? What is the motivation for smashing it? In what direction are you, are you smashing it? And, a lot of times these people who claim to be very intellectual, their intellect is actually being guided and controlled by their ego and their shadow Mm. without them knowing it. So it actually acts as a defense of ignorance. So they're, they're just very, very smart at concealing and defending their own ignorance, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which, which, which happens a lot. We know with these, uh, well, and the most professional ones, they're the ones who become pseudo skeptics. You know, they're the ones out there like James Randi and all these, all these people out there, you know, uh, you know, trying, trying to demolish anything that's higher. Um, They're just, they're just, shadows that use the the intellect as a weapon to defend greater in greater levels of ignorance but yeah so intuition and precognition are they're things that come from our you know from our higher self ultimately you know of our spirit core you know, our higher chakra functions the higher emotional and higher intellectual centers that, that's that's what those are um extensions of and that supersedes logic and reason because like i said logic and reason is only as good as the assumptions and the and the the subconscious motivations that guide them. So you have to have something outside of all that 
to let you know when you're on the trail of truth or, you know, when you're are in error. And if you have good intuition, you know, you can think about an idea, you can do research, you can read a book and you can sense when something is off. You know, you can, you can sense when, when just something isn't right about it. And if you take that feeling and you feel into it and you use your sense of reason at this point, now your reason then can, you know, do like a, like an autopsy on what it is that you felt was off and you can actually put into words what you feel is off. And therefore you can discover a lot of the flaws with a lot of these, you know, false belief systems that are out there. So that's actually the process that I use for a lot of what I write on my, on my website. You know, I do a lot, I do a lot of research and, and then, yeah, you're going to say something. Yeah, no, no, because I was just looking at your website. It reminds me of the article, very really excellent article you wrote, Transcendence Through Intuitive Thinking. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you, what you mentioned, talk about very important to, you know, learn the mind, train the mind, understand logic, critical thinking on the basic level. Like it's important to, you know, think with the hammer, so to speak, but don't understand also the limitations of so-called 3D thinking logic. And that's where intuition comes in, right? Inspiration and all of that, and also emotional intelligence to, to really fuse the both of it. Right? Because you said, you're right, like, I mean, I see there's so many amazing, again, going back to the truth of and, you know, popular researchers out there who have almost like scholars have amazing information, but the intellect is just overriding. And I can see exactly the trap you said, almost the, the, the mind becomes their own enemy. Mm -hmm. right of just always rationalizing justify justifying you know and that's also the entry point of these forces when they're not aware thought injections is kind of feeding the intellect and i think it was even good if you said oh moravi if you know in the model of man one two and three you know the motion the physical emotional and intellectual man that in terms of esoteric awakening or work or doing the work man three intellectual man um has almost the hardest path to pierce through this overriding intellect right and then we also in this, what I feel a big uh, part or symptom of the matrix setup is, especially in our modern world, is this head-centric existence of living in the head and, you know, contributing to the body-mind split, disconnect from our body, from our gut feeling, intuition, the wisdom of our bodies. Right? And, you know, many people are clever, intellect, highly intellectual, but sometimes even out there in the so-called truth movement uh, have the emotional intelligence of a 10-year-old, right? So it's like, it's just... <laughs> work harmonized together. And that's when, again, the, the inner work comes in, right? To really like become self-aware, observant. And, you know, like I mentioned before, that the issue you see in the so-called truth movement is also the, the way they feed the agendas because a lot of, you know, I understand that there's a saying, you know, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then project, you know, almost it comes from, a, from their own place of wounding and trauma, not, not being happy or satisfied in their own life. Mm -hmm. And then project externally and then blame, right? How we're being controlled and what uh, the matrix and the government and these institutions are doing to us, which they are, of course, we are being controlled and enslaved to a degree. But then they pierce, don't pierce three or to the deeper spiritual esoteric component, understanding universal laws, for example, right? Um, absolute laws. And then um, don't see the teaching function of the bigger picture of the evolution of consciousness and that how we need to more, you know, not fight sides, but transcend. It was almost ties into like, you know, an understanding of transcending of duality and whatnot. And really like uh, understanding that this awakening process uh, doesn't happen by trying to get rid of the other side, right? That's actually an STS component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just let me finish. So yeah, so I'll, I'll yeah. round off. I'll uh, finish off that thought with, you know, if you know someone who's like that, or, you know, if you're kind of going in that direction yourself, what can you do to, to snap out of it? Mm -hmm. And, and here's, here's just a couple, a couple ideas. Of course, you know, first of all, it's really important to expand your field of research beyond just the 3D conspiracy. There's so much stuff out there. You know, there's a whole uh, hermetic, Gnostic, you know, metaphysical stuff about consciousness and reality, you know, the whole quantum reality creation, you know, the whole thing. Uh, definitely think harder and deeper and try to use your intuition as a compass. You know, don't just like read and regurgitate. Uh, analyze your own motivations, your root assumptions, your limiting beliefs and potential shadow issues, you know, like research Bernhard's work about inner work, shadow work. And that's so important um, because like I said, those are the things that are beneath the level of reason that manipulate and bias your, your rational line of thought. So you think you're being rational, but you're, you're not actually unless you analyze where those subconscious motivations are actually coming from. That's why you have to look within to make sure that you are being objective. Uh, pay more attention to the impulses of spirit, you know, things like heart, uh, insight, revelation, wisdom, uh, creativity, 
any, any sort of impulse of transcendence that gets you outside of your head and grounded into a higher level of object of uh, objectivity and a higher level of objectivity. I don't mean like science. I'm, I'm talking about like Gnostic, like the truth about reality and why we're really here and who we really are that level of objectivity. Uh, recognize the role that thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and the subconscious play in shaping reality. And, you know, Unfortunately, most are unwilling because they are slave to their egos or they're in it for entertainment and tribalism. So they're getting played. But uh, I think anyone who has this as a kind of a, a weak spot, there are ways out of it. And it's just as simple as stepping outside that comfort zone and exploring what's out there and therefore expanding your perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, beautifully said, Tom. Excellent. So that, I think we are done. It's almost an hour now, right? I kind of lost track of time. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, yeah, that was it for the first hour. And again, for any, for all the viewers or listeners, check out Tom's website. Uh, it's montalk.net, M-O-N-T-A-L-K.net. Amazing body of work, many articles, eBooks to download. Um, you also produce some excellent videos. There's, I think this three part video about the matrix control system, what, what were the three parts? Yeah, yeah. So if you go to youtube.com slash Tom Montauk, just one word, Tom Montauk, it, it's all on there. It's under my Fringe Knowledge video playlist. Yeah, so I've got one about the matrix control system, about the five critical weaknesses mm -hmm. that humans have that allow us to get played. And then if those two videos seem kind of dark for you, then the third one <laughs> is where I get into spirit over mind and mind over matter, where I talk about the positive solutions and, and what, it, what, what the real key is to, uh, you know, to transcending the matrix within ourselves, especially. Yeah. So those three videos are there and I got another new video about synchronicity. Yeah, which is excellent. Yeah. Which is also worth checking out. Yeah. yeah. So I have that and I've got free, free eBooks on my website. So and articles and everything. So, yeah, no, great. So we're going to stop right here, but uh, then in the second hour, which by the way, is only available for members um, uh, at my website, which also gives you access to the membership forum, which by the way, Tom is also part of, and we exchange thoughts and ideas and go deep into various topics. And it's a nice community away from the public, so to speak. And then you have also access to all the second hour podcasts, including this one. And I will release this uh, talk with Tom as a video on YouTube and as, as a, as an audio podcast. But again, for the second hour, if you're not already a member, go to veilofreality.com. That's my website, and you can sign up there. In the second hour, <clears throat> just to give ideas, I would like to go talk a bit what we didn't touch upon in the first. I want to go deeper a bit in, into UFO phenomena, talking about disclosure and alien disinformation, and then especially want to go into the topic of entity interferences and attachments, and also talking about your experience of protection and clearing and uh, about emotional management, I want to talk about how to deal with emotional triggers and uh, how you know interferences can break apart groups, relationships, and how to avoid getting into reactive emotional response to stop feeding these matrix forces. And I also would like to touch upon the positive forces, right? There are divine positive forces who are here to help assist us and how can we, um, quote unquote, request their help without falling into a trap of agreements and whatnot and how do positive forces truly um, help us and you know that also ties a bit into reality creation but that will be touched upon in this second hour see you guys there thank you tom